Name Nombres by Julia Alvarez. When we arrived in New York City, our names changed almost immediately. At immigration, the officer asked my father, Mr. Alvarez, if he had anything to declare. My father shook his head no, and we were waved through. I was too afraid we wouldn't be let in if I corrected the man's pronunciation, but I said our name to myself, opening my mouth wide for the organ blast of the ah, thrilling my tongue for the drum roll of the r, r, all Alvarez. How could anyone get Alvarez out of that orchestra of sound? At the hotel, my mother was Mrs. Alvarez, and I was little girl, as in, hey, little girl, stop riding the elevator up and down. It's not a toy. We moved into our new apartment building. The super called my father Mr. Alvarez, and the neighbors, who also became mother's friends, pronounced her new name Julia instead of Julia. I, her namesake, was known as Julita at home, but at school I was Judy or Judith, and once an English teacher mistook me for Juliet. It took me a while to get used to my new names, but I wondered if I shouldn't correct my teachers and my friends. But my mother argued that it didn't matter. You know what your friend Shakespeare said: "A rose by any other name would smell as sweet." My family had gotten into the habit of calling any famous author my friend because I had begun to write poems and stories in English. By the time I was in high school, I was a popular kid, and it showed in my name. Friends called me Jules or Hey Jude, and once a group of troublemaking friends, mother forbade me to hang out with, even called me Alcatraz. I was Hulita, only to mommy and poppy, and uncles and aunts who came over to eat sanchacho on Sunday afternoons. Old world folk whom I would just as soon as go back to where they came from and leave me to pursue whatever mischief I wanted to in America. Judy Alcatraz, the name on the wanted poster, would read. Who would ever trace her to me? My older sister had the hardest time getting an American name for herself because Maracia did not translate into English. Ironically, although she had the most foreign-sounding name, she and I were the Americans in the family. She had been born in New York City when our parents had first tried immigration and then gone back home, too homesick to stay. My mother often told the story of how she had almost changed my sister's name in the hospital. After the delivery, mommy and some other new mothers were cooing over their new baby sons and daughters and exchanging names and waits and delivery stories. My mother was embarrassed among the Sallies, the Janes, the Georges, and the Johns to reveal the rich and noisy name of Marcia. So when her turn came to brag, she gave her baby's name, Maureen. Why'd you give her an Irish name with so many pretty Spanish names to choose from? One of one of the women asked. My mother blushed and admitted her baby's real name to the group. Her mother-in-law had recently died. She apologized, and her husband had insisted that the first daughter be named after his mother, Moran. My mother thought it was the ugliest name she had ever heard, and she talked my father into what she believed was an improvement—a combination of Moran and her own mother's name, Felicia. Her name is Morasia, my mother said to the group of women. Why, that's a beautiful name! The new mothers cried. Morisha, Morisha! They cooed into the pink blanket. Morisha! It was when we returned to the states eleven years later. Sometimes American tongues even found even that pronunciation a mispronunciation tough to say, and called her Maria or Marcia or Mari from her nickname Murray. I pitied her. What an awful name to have to transport across borders. My little sister Anna had the easiest time of all. She was plain Anne. That is, only her name was plain, for she turned out to be a pale blonde American beauty in the family. The only Hispanic thing about her was her affectionate nicknames her boyfriends sometimes gave her. Anita, or one goofy guy, used to sing to her to the tune of banana advertisement. Anita Banana. Later, during her college years in the late sixties, there was a push to pronounce third world names correctly. I remember calling her long distance at her group house and a roommate answering. "Can I speak to Anna?" I asked, pronouncing her name the American way. "Anna?" the man's voice hesitated. "Oh, you mean Anna?" Our first few years in the states, though ethnicity was not yet in. 
Those were the blonde, blue-eyed, bobby socky years of junior high and high school before the 60s ushered in pleasant blouses, hoop earring seraphs. My initial desire to be known by my correct Dominican name faded. I just wanted to be Judy and merge in with the Sallys and the Janes in my class. But, inevitably, my accent and color gave me away. So where are you from, Judy? New York, I told my classmates. After all, I had been born blocks away from Columbia, the Presbyterian Hospital. No, 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 I mean originally from the Caribbean, I answered vaguely. For if I specified, no one was quite sure of what continent or island was located. Really? I have been to the Bermuda. We went last spring, last April for spring vacation. I got the worst sunburn. So are you from Puerto Rico? No, I sighed. From the Dominican Republic. Where's that? South of Bermuda. They were just being curious, I knew, but I burned with shame whenever they singled me out as a foreigner, a rare, exotic friend. Say your name in Spanish. Oh, please say it. I had made mouths drop one day by rattling off my full name, which according to the Dominican custom included my middle names, mothers and fathers, surnames for four generations back. Julia, Altagracia, Maria, Teresa, Avres, and Taveres, Pereo, Espalat, Julia, Perez, Roche, Gonzalez. I pronounced it slowly, a name so chaotic with sounds as a Middle Eastern bazaar on a, on a market day in South American village. My Dominican heritage was never more obvious, apparent than when my extended family attended school occasions. For my graduation, they all came, the whole lot of aunts and uncles, and the many little cousins who snuck in without tickets. They sat in the front row in order to better understand the Americans' fast-spoken English. But how could they listen when they were constantly speaking among themselves in florid-sounding phrases, the rococo consonants rich in rhyming vowel? Introducing them to my friends was a further trial to me. These relatives had much complicated names, and there were so many of them, and their relationship to myself was just so convoluted. There was my Thea Josefina, who was not really an aunt, but as much as my older cousin, and her daughter, um, Ida Margarita, who was adopted, uh, my, my uncle of affection, Tia Jose, brought my um, madrina Tia Mamilia with her um, comrade, Tia Pilar. Uh, my friends rarely had more than a mom and a dad to introduce. After the commencement ceremony, my family waited outside in the parking lot while my friends and I signed yearbooks with nicknames which recalled our high school good times. Beans and pepperonis and Alcatraz. We hugged and cried and promised to keep in touch. Our goodbyes went on too long, and I heard my father's voice calling out across the parking lot, Hola, ta, vamonos! Back home, my tios and tias and primas and mommy and papi and mis hermanas and at a party were many gifts that were a plus to a large family. I got several wallets and a suitcase with my initials and graduation charm from my godmother and money from my uncles. And the biggest gift was a portable typewriter from my parents for writing my stories and poems. Someday, the family predicted my name would be well known throughout the United States. I laughed to myself, wondering which one I would go by. <laughs>